Hello, everyone who's joining. Um, we'll just give a couple of minutes to let everybody through the waiting room. But uh, those of you who haven't already, uh, when you join, if you could just make sure that your microphones are muted. Thank you. Has anyone yet found a mechanism to deal with these horrible two minutes? <laughs> you know, have you found... I don't know. I, I've not been, music, shouldn't we? So start yeah, music. I don't know whether you play silly background music or you have a game of guess what stupid thing was said on TV by a politician last night or something. But we do need something to fill these horrible two minutes. I'm going with yeah, the lift maybe. music, but but yeah, in lieu maybe. of the lift music, maybe we just start. Yeah. Shall we hum? <laughs> Excellent. So in order to save uh, participants from uh, everybody having to hum along to fill the gap, I think I will get started with some of the housekeeping, which uh, we need to get through before we get into the, the meat of today's webinar. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name's Amy Peace. I'm the Innovation Lead for Circular Economy at Innovate UK, based in within our manufacturing materials team, but working across various programmes that we have in Innovate and also on some cross-council programmes, such as the NICER programme, which is where I'm particularly pleased to have been asked to uh, chair today's webinar. So this is, I, I gather, about the third or fourth webinar in this series, and we're looking at 10 years on in circular economy. We'll come on to what does that mean shortly. And if you would like any more information, I'll look at what webinars have been done in the past and other past recordings, and please do go to the ce-hub.org website. Okay, let's see if we can progress slides. So as I've already indicated, uh, housekeeping, classic housekeeping rules here. We are recording this webinar and it will be available on the CE Hub website afterwards. If you don't want to be included, please do keep your cameras off. Um, you should have been automatically muted upon arrival, but if you haven't been or if you've accidentally slipped and turned your microphone uh, off mute, please put it back on mute. It does help uh, when speakers are presenting. I think we're going to go for questions via the chat. Uh, you are welcome to do a bit of commentary as we go along, um, but we will pull up those questions and commentary until after all of our speakers have spoken. So this is where we are today, 10 years on in circular economy. And uh, we did have a bit of a discussion before, just to clarify, and I'm sure other people will be saying this, didn't circular economy exist before 10 years ago? Yes, it did. But we are particularly marking um, a very important report that was done with the um, McKinsey and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and presented at the World Economic Forum 10 years ago and trying to look in that sort of time frame as what has happened since then, but also looking what's going to happen going forward and where do we need to go. So I'm very pleased to um, introduce the panel that we've got here today. So we have Jamie Butterworth from Circularity Capital, who obviously investing in startups and really interesting um, circular businesses, but previously was the CEO and co-founder of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So very much well qualified to talk about uh, what's happened in the last 10 years. We also have Julia Stegman from the um, Interdisciplinary Circular Economy Centre for Mineral-Based Construction Materials within the NISA programme. She is the principal investigator there, but also a professor of environmental engineering at UCL. And then finally, but certainly not least, uh, Professor Steve Evans uh, from the... Um, I've, sorry, I just lost, lost my track there. Um, he is the uh, lead on the Centre for Industrial Sustainability at the Institute for Manufacturing, but also the co-investigator of the Textile Circularity Centre, also part of the NISA programme. So onwards, we, as I say, we're going to have about five minutes each per speaker. Um, as I say, do put comments and questions in the chat and then we will come on to them at the end. So Jamie, I believe you are going to talk freestyle without slides, so over to you. Thank you very much, Amy, and uh, great to be speaking to you all on the session today. Um, yeah, so just thought I would cover three topics. So the first was a bit of a perspective around the last decade and kind of what's happened. Um, I then thought it might be interesting to just go on and talk about why I believe that there are a number of um, kind of macro trends that are continuing to drive interest and momentum in the circular economy. And then just a few thoughts around um, the kind of way forward, the route ahead, challenges and opportunities. 
Um, so yeah, the circular economy clearly existed before uh, a decade ago, but um, to kind of think back to that period of time, in about 2010, it was very evident that there were a number of academic reports uh, that started to describe uh, in the kind of 1980s, 1990s, a different type of economy, one in which we moved away from this linear take, make, dispose model of production and consumption to one where we had defined nutrient cycles of technical nutrients that were products designed to be used again or upgraded, biological nutrients that were designed to safely degrade and create value through living systems powered by renewable energy. And uh, William Madonna and Michael Browngart had done a lot of work through Cradle to Cradle in kind of outlining that. And other parties like um, Professor Walter Stahl had written a book called The Performance Economy in 1978, I believe, um, looking at the shift away from owning products towards uh, buying performance or providing service. And so the thing that happened in 2010 was the first time I think anyone had tried to put a figure on how the economics of this would work and whether indeed the circular economy would stack up versus the linear economy. Could it indeed create more value? Could it employ more people? Could it create a more resilient economy? Um, and that was the question that the Alan MacArthur Foundation was trying to answer in 2010. And indeed that report, which went to the World Economic Forum in 2011, I remember I wanted to share a particular anecdote which was going through that report about uh, a week before it was due to go to the World Economic Forum and removing every reference in it to sustainability, to climate, to green, to anything on that topic and purely trying to articulate to the very business orientated audience in Davos that the circular economy was an opportunity from a business perspective. And I think at the time that landed quite well because corporate businesses were really challenged with how to deal with sustainability and at the time, it was all about persuading their customers to buy less stuff. Um, and so ultimately, the idea that um, you could still create value, but it was about providing service and designing products and materials in a different way that was attractive to them and it landed well. So really, that was just bringing together the kind of economic story of standing on the shoulders of all these other um, participants who'd actually outlined what that type of economy might look like. Um, since then, uh, I have shifted my uh, kind of interest really into the area around investment. I was always convinced at that time that ultimately you would need to demonstrate to capital markets that these circular business models could create more value. And that was the emphasis on setting up circularity capital to do that. We've now raised two funds, um, the latest of which was a 215 million euro funds, which uh, is invested in by large pension funds, uh, kind of sovereign wealth fund, funder funds, et cetera, with fund one performing well, both from a financial and an impact perspective. And that's really driven more investors to come into the market and start to back these types of companies. And as you know, capital markets need to see the commercial and financial opportunity to come in with more capital. So I think that is an important proof point in the market. And it, it's being helped by more and more investors coming into this space, both in the public quoted markets and also the private markets. And just to illustrate the kind of level of difference there, uh, when we raised the, our first fund in 2015 to 2018, um, no one that we were talking to had ever really heard of the circular economy. So we would find ourselves in meeting rooms with pension funds or sovereign wealth funds or similar. And we would spend the first 20 minutes of that meeting describing what the circular economy was, why we thought it was a good investment opportunity. By the time we were raising our second fund in 2021 to 22, almost everyone had heard of the circular economy. They didn't necessarily have a really detailed understanding of the ins and outs of it, but everyone had heard of the term. It's now become part of the vernacular within the investment world. And I think that is um, kind of interesting then to think what's driving that. And we think there are four things driving that. The first one, is simply the circular business models can actually create more value. They can create stickier customer relationships, higher margin business models with these assets being used multiple times. It's attractive from a commercial perspective. Secondly, we're also definitely seeing an increase in consumers who are interested in the provenance of products and the sustainability of products. That's driving, that's driving corporates to also act in this space. And that's being further accelerated by a number of legislative and regulatory 
um, kind of development. So the direction of travel around that, including things like the EU circular economy package. The third thing that's driving this is also technology. So the more we know with regards to the location status, demand and condition of assets through things like the use of smartphones is often opening up the use of more circular business models or the transition towards these servitization models. And finally, we're also seeing real interest from investors in identifying opportunities to create financial value as well as have a positive impact um, on both uh, people but also the environment and we're seeing that coming through with a really big increase in the amount of capital moving towards impact investing products um, so i'm going to stop at that point i've got a couple of points to make around the kind of the way forward and some of the challenges that we might face over the next few years given what's going on in the macro uh, geopolitical context, but we can come back to that in due course. Absolutely, yeah. Let, let's let's see where we are at the moment, and then uh, we'll we'll definitely be discussing where to go next uh, later on. Thanks very much, Jamie. Right. Uh, so next we have Julia. Um, put a spotlight on you, Julia. There we go. Off you go. Just need to come off your mute. Yeah. And you're still on mute. There. It's always tricky. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, the sector economy is a very paradigm shifting concept. And in fact, it's one of those things where I remember exactly where I was when I first heard the words, which was, in fact, just about 10 years ago in April 2012, when that report came out from the um, MacArthur Foundation and McKinsey. And, uh, and I was working with a colleague on two proposals, one on SEM0, a range of cements without carbon intensive cement clinker, and another one on recovery of elements from air pollution control residue. And um, he came in and he said, you have to read this. I reckon it's going to change everything. And um, it didn't change anything for our proposals, which um, were both actually not funded, um, but it does seem gradually this idea of the circular economy is changing everything. Um, for one thing, BSI is now developing a standard for geopolymers and alkali activated cementitious materials. It's not a panacea, but it may provide a path towards specification of lower carbon concretes um, through industrial symbiosis, which is a key mechanism in a circular economy. And by developing the standard rapidly as a flex standard, they intend for it to be available in two years, which is actually a very um, rapid time frame for standards development, as anyone who's ever worked in standards development will know. Um, so 10 years on from the McKinsey report, there are in fact now quite a few sustainable and circular products in the marketplace and many more in development. Um, a search of the academic literature on circular economy shows that by 2012, there are already 550 papers about it. But if you search today, there are 15, more than 15,000, and it's not actually possible to review the literature. And likewise, in the marketplace, there's too much to easily provide an overview. Um, so I'm just going to show a few, um, or just actually two illustrative examples of products from my own experience at UCL, and then highlight some of the challenges that we're still facing. Um, so, th so this slide um, shows preparations for testing of a reusable floor cassette composed of clinker-free cement and steel girders using UCL's new bridge testing rig at here east in the Olympic Park. And, and this is a circular product that was developed by a consortium of different engineering disciplines with a grant from the Industrial Challenge Fund. Both concrete and steel tend to be downcycled, so a deconstructible module of this kind has great potential for retaining these materials at higher value. But before it goes on the market, a range of other disciplines, not only from engineering, will need to be involved for an examination and accounting of all the impacts and development of logistics and business models for its use. Um, my second example is cross-laminated secondary timber. Um, you may be familiar with ordinary cross-laminated timber, which is a structural timber product comprised of perpendicular layers of wood, kind of like um, most people are more familiar with glue lamb. So it's glue lamb, where glue lamb is beam, um, CLT is a, is a plane. Um, and its use has been accelerating in the marketplace over several decades, especially as more renewable materials um, become more popular, um, whether or not they're actually resulting in reduced emissions is a contentious issue. 
But anyway, CLST from uh, Waste Timber from Construction and Demolition is being developed by Colin Rose based on work that in, he did in his PhD with funding from Ramble and UCL. Um, there are something like 200 million tons of timber in the UK building stock, which is being released at a rate of 2 million tons a year, while increasing amounts are being specified in new construction, particularly as CLT. Um, and at present, half of waste timber is incinerated and the rest is downcycled and landfilled. So this idea of CLST um, is upcycling of waste to replace a substantial quantity of virgin raw material with the potential for reuse and cascading and to add value locally with environmental and societal benefits. For it to be widely adopted, though, we still need to develop appropriate standards and technology and logistics for its manufacturing at full scale. Um, so there are a number of challenges still ahead and they're very time consuming and require investment. Um, and I've just listed a couple of the, or three of the challenges here that I are at the forefront of my mind. Um, and so the first one is how can businesses and sectors and government work together for collection of the data we need for a systems level understanding of how we use our resources. One of the main developments of the past decade has been that businesses are starting to keep accounts of their material flows and their impacts through supply chains. But in most cases, businesses are prioritizing product development of a systemic understanding of how they use materials. So for a circular economy with appropriate industrial symbiosis and cascading, data collection needs to reach another level within businesses and across the economy. It seems inevitable that for maximum resource efficiency, data needs to be widely shared. So how can we avoid fragmentation and develop systems that are transparent and interoperable while protecting business commercial interests? And then um, another challenge is creating a level playing field for natural and anthropogenic resources. We have all kinds of controls on wastes which are justifiable, um, but they're not applied to natural um, resources. And I think in this regard, a key development is the United Nations Framework Classification for Anthropogenic Resources, which classifies resources for investors based on their quantities, technical feasibility of recovery and sustainability. Um, but what else can we do in this area? And then finally, and specifically in relation, I think my other two points apply across the circular economy, but and especially in relation to the built environment. Um, buildings and, and um, structures have a very long lifespan. So how do we find business models um, that necessarily differ from those now where we separate the phases of design, construction, service, and operation? So that's me. Great, thank you very much, Julia. And now we move on to Steve. Morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, we're going from the long lifespan to the shortest. I'm going to be speaking from the viewpoint of the Textile Circularity Centre and Clothing. I'll explain this strange shirt in a minute. Uh, we were given exam questions. What's changed in the last 10 years? I think we can recognise, and Jamie had a really good start there, uh, fantastically improved recognition of what a circular economy is amongst certain groups. I would say we've done a really good job in education, a really good job in politics, a pretty good job for many people in business, but not quite everyone. More people now understand what a circular economy is and why we need it. But I think there's a gap. And the gap is less understanding of how. And what we're getting are people asking how questions. They're going, no, I understand the idea of a circular economy, but I need help in delivering how. And that's why Julia now gets research money for ideas that were 10 years ahead of its time. You need to send those proposals in again because they're not, the world is now ready for them because those are answering how questions. How do we actually deliver circularity? We're not scaling the circular economy at the speed that the world needs. So yes, we have to put a big tick in the good box. Lit literacy around circularity has improved. Action, ugh, big question mark. And part of our research is in trying to understand why. Why are we not, if this thing is so 
blinking fantastic. Why is the world not jumping on the particular train? I'm going to say that, and there's been references to business models in there, business model design and playfulness is easy. We see many companies imagining their business model. What if I, my car company went into renting and not allowing people to own the cars that we build? But how many of them are then implementing those business models? And one of the challenges is that uh, in the linear economy, we know how to design something and then prototype it and build it at scale. We struggle to do that in a circular world because the business models often rely on the actions of others. It often relies, for example, on political change or the waste system changing in parallel. So I think that coordination is central, that no single organization has the power to deliver a circular economy, even if their own business model idea is a good one. They, they fear implementing the business model because one, they could be the pioneer who gets killed and the fast follower wins, but two, because actually it requires others to go on the same journey with them simultaneously. And that's not a risk that you can bet your own company on. So coordination, I think, is going to become an incredibly important piece of the conversation. At the Textile Circularity Center, we focus on the small disruptors. So not only are we shorter lifetime, we're really interested in how the small players can disrupt the large clothing players rather than trying to get to the large clothing players first. And I'll offer my example here. This shirt is made by a company called Brzega Hill and it's made in Uganda by a fantastic designer who went home and got really beeped off at containers of clothing arriving from around the world and destroying the Ugandan own clothing industry and he decided I'm going to stop this but I'm going to take advantage of these containers so this shirt is made from a Tommy Hilfiger shirt that had previously been sold and worn out in South Korea, gets put into a container, gets sent to Uganda. In Uganda, they pick it up, they redesign it, they turn it into a fashionable object, and they sell it to me for stupidly large amounts of money. Now, it's not a perfect circular economy, but it's certainly disruptive. And what we want in the Textile Circularity Center is to encourage small disruptors to take up as many possible ideas as they can. So we're going for the thousand flowers blooming strategy rather than betting on a very particular technology. We're very keen that those flowers, because they are flowers, are part of the natural world. So we're interested in them using biomaterials rather than, for example, polyester. And that's a large part of the work that we do in our research. What's happening next? Um, I think politically and strategically, we've missed many chances. The world needs circular now. And if we'd started properly five years ago, we might be in a good position now, but we are where we are. And I think that the 2022 position could hardly be worse because we are messing up everything, but could hardly be better in the sense of sending a demand signal for a circular economy. So people are asking, what are we going to do? The need to understand systems connections. We're getting increased material literacy, but systems literacy is also an important part of that. And I think it's happening. Julia, if we take something akin to your world, if you try to recycle high strength steel from a car body, that now contains 40 elements and about 38 of those are in tiny, tiny quantities that get lost, typically get lost in the recycling process. So one of the issues that we have to deal with is our current recycling systems are very good at getting at the high volume molecules, at the iron molecule, at the copper molecule, but they're actually very bad at getting at the other 38. And that means that if we go highly circular, we are driving a linear system at greater speed for these other molecules. And I think that that's a little interesting side problem that we need to put some work on. We also need to better understand transformation strategies. This issue of who goes first needs to be resolved. 
is this a co-evolution? How do people take steps that actually result in eventually becoming fully circular? I, I simply don't think we understand that well enough. And I'm going to put out three watchwords for the future, for the next five and ten years. We've got circularity literacy, but I think that the world wants material security. And that may be a phrase that we use more often because we're forced to. I think data, which Julia mentioned, is going to be incredibly important. This is a knowledge-based solution, and the use of data to encourage circularity is going to be important. And the last word, it's back to coordination. So let's see if we can coordinate some good questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steve. Now I'm going to add some more spotlights to the rest of the panel, if you just give me a moment. Uh, It'll let me spotlight everybody at once. I was only going to let me uh, spotlight one or two. Add spotlights. That's what we want to do. Great. Thank you very much. Now, I think some of you have already started putting uh, questions into the chat. I would encourage uh, more of that, please. That would be great. I just want to do uh, one very quick question um, first, which I think has been touched on by a couple of you that um, Certainly the awareness for circular economy has vastly increased in this last 10 years. And we're seeing people use the terminology a lot more, which comes with its own problems. As you say, it used to be you could pick up a couple of reports a year and now um, we wouldn't be able to read every report that comes with circular economy in the title, even if we put all our hours in the day onto it. And obviously, as funders, we often see a lot of circular economy used in um, funding proposals whether it was explicitly in the funding and um, programme title or whether it's just sort of our general smart things. But often those projects, when we actually look at them in detail, go, that's not really circular economy. So do you think almost kind of this awareness has gone into the realms of it's another buzzword to attach onto things to try and make companies look good? Or where do we have to police the term more? Or shouldn't we police? Should we be delighted that people actually are using circular economy more? Jamie, if I could come to you first on that as a... Uh, yeah, so um, there's a particular context to this as well from an investment perspective. So you're probably aware that um, as more funds are labeling themselves as either kind of impact sustainability or ESG focused funds, there's increasing rigor around how they're actually kind of validating that. Um, so there's actually in Europe, um, there's something called the Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation, which sounds quite boring, but actually probably quite groundbreaking. And it requires all funds to label themselves from one to nine. Uh, one being we don't care what we invest in, it could be anything. And nine being we actually are investing in things that are sustainable. And if you are in that category, you then need to be, be able to actually demonstrate and substantiate that you're not doing any significant harm. And you have to designate in what respect the impact is being generated effectively. Um, so I think that is really helpful. Now, from a circular economy perspective, this is fascinating because You've got the thing you mentioned, Amy, whereby you've got companies that are labeling themselves circular, but arguably are just more linear efficiency. And you've also got businesses which are circular, but are not necessarily having any impact versus business as usual. So, for example, if I was to invest in a northern European traditional recycling company, and would I actually grow the impact of the circular economy? I'm gonna argue probably not because the way the growth is gonna come about is either through financial engineering or taking market share from another existing competitor. So um, you can then go a step further and actually say, we're only gonna invest in businesses where we can see that there is an impact versus business as usual. So we'll look very carefully at what's happening today and then we'll try to measure the impact of this investment versus that. So I think it is a really fascinating topic and something that we spend a lot of time working on. We've got dedicated people internally who spend their whole time looking at impact versus business as usual um, in that regard. Great. I mean, I think, Steve, you might kind of have something from the textiles point of view here, but certainly something we're seeing when you look at the whole system rather than individual sectors is we do see there are problems with things like um, fashion retailers kind of saying this is a sustainable fashion because it's used recycled pet bottles. And yet the bottle industry is going, where's all our pet gone? Because we want to make recycled bottles. So do you have any comments on, on that sort of cross-sectoral sort of optimization and where people think they're doing the right thing within their bubble, but maybe not in, as we look at the big picture? 
Uh, I, I'm of the let a thousand flowers blossom. Um, and even if there is stupidity out there, there is increasing literacy. Uh, because I fear that otherwise somebody has to appoint themselves the god of circularity and they're going to get all decisions right. How you raise the bar on a coordinated, multi action, multi organizational change is incredibly difficult. So part of it is raising literacy, raising the amount of actions, and then people will, when you combine those two things, eventually realize what I did two years ago was really rather stupid. But I got where I am today by doing those stupid things two years ago. So I want to encourage that. That that and you know, I'm very taken by Jamie's argument that also you have to increase the speed of that literacy so they do less stupid things early on in their journey. Excellent. Okay, so I'll go to one of our questions um, from the audience and again, encouraging others there to post some more questions. But I think this is a sort of related one here, uh, which is most companies discount the value of assets over time. So what do we need to do to ensure that that intrinsic value and embedded carbon are recognized and valued at the point of of transition from first use? Any thoughts on this? I mean, Julia, kind of some of the the timescale aspects, I think, come in here a bit on, on sort of when you value a building and do we still have that value at end of life on, on sort of how companies deal with those building materials? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's to do with accounting practice, isn't it? Because depreciation is, is a, a standard way of, of accounting for our, our capital investments. And um, I mean, one of the, we have in, within the Circular Economy Center for Mineral-Based Construction Materials, one of our streams is on looking at accounting practices. It's not at all my personal expertise, um, but clearly they need to change and we need to find ways to value and revalue um, the things that we own um, that differ from the way that we, we did it um, before. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the building industry, we obviously had programs like sort of the Construction Innovation Hub, and they've got a value toolkit, which I think has been quite an interesting one in trying to get developers and those involved at the early stage of construction, not you know thinking about those broader senses of value for not just that first use of the building, but kind of the materials as they go further through into kind of second life and beyond. Yeah. Uh, Jamie or Steve, any, any more va- it, comments yeah. on that? I just want to say, and value, value is, if value is not just financial value, we need to value impacts as well. And I think that's part of the accounting system that um, needs to be developed. Great. Steve? Wouldn't it be wonderful if construction companies got angry that the waste companies were making more profit than they were? So if, they, they, un- are. if, <laughs> if they understood that, that would cause them to look at their actions at the end of life of their own product it's like wait a minute we're enabling all sorts of other people to make money why don't we grab that excellent uh jamie any more on value assets embedded carbon etc for going into second life you're on mute yeah so we've invested now in four product as a service companies um one that does it assets you never own the asset you have access to iphones tablets gaming equipment, et cetera. And then when you finished, it gets refurbished and goes out to another customer. So kind of flexible rental, same for office furniture, same for bicycles, et cetera. We've done multiple investments in these companies and it is really fascinating to look at how to scale the business because one of the things that you need to be able to do obviously is to, well, firstly, you want to optimize the asset. So the asset can be it can last as long as possible. You want product life extension. You want to reduce the mothballing between users. So there are things that you can do to integrate circular design philosophy into existing products to try and eke that out and, and generate a higher margin. And then also you need to finance those assets. So you need to put the debt in place to be able to grow the business because the business itself owns the assets and it becomes in their interest to keep them going longer. So, um, and that's been really interesting. And in fact, um, one of the first times that we were looking at this particular uh, furnish comp- furniture company called Lendis, based in Germany, which provides this B2B um, uh, rental of all things that you need in your office for more than 2,000 German um, kind of large uh, uh, corporate businesses. 
And within there, um, part of the work is to integrate circular design philosophy. So go, for example, in furniture from moving using screws to using bolts. Um, and that in itself can mean that you can then take the product apart more often and refurbish it. So we have this KPI system, which is a continual improvement system for making the product more and more durable, more and more modular, easier to repair, etc. And we were describing this to a particular lender because we were putting in place more um, debt to finance the growing asset base. And they loved this to the point that they actually came back to us with a system that incentivized the number of cycles that we can get out of the debt product. So even the debt providers are now, whereas if we tried to do that five years ago, they would never have heard of the circular economy. And we would have had a long discussion about whether anyone would actually ever want to rent a desk or a chair. Whereas now the thinking has really moved on to the point that these other financial providers are starting to think about how you could incentivize, incentivize and accelerate it. So it's a really interesting topic. I think there's way more to go on that as well. Yeah, and in fact, I've suggested kind of for our, some of our collaborative R&D programs, actually, sometimes the collaborator might not be a technical provider. It might actually be a financial product provider because taking those assets onto a company book for kind of a lease, I think, doesn't suit all businesses. So look for a collaborator that can help you deal with that. It can be an interesting sort of innovative approach. Excellent. OK, we better move on. We we'll start to get some more questions into the chat. So we have one specifically on plastic credits, which I think relates a bit to what you were saying, Jamie, about recyclers. But do you think plastic credits are a positive contribution to the circular economy movement in helping funding recycling projects? Or if not, what do you think the key challenges are in plastics going forward? Dare I ask? Anyone opinions on plastics? I'll, I'll be brave. Go on, Steve. Because I'm, I'm nearly retired and nobody can sack me. Right? <laughs> um, look, plastics are in its end game. And you know, this is the last writhings of an industry that's fight, trying to find a solution, but it'll be gone. In the same way as the number one job in London 120 years ago was shoveling horseshit. We do not care that that job has disappeared. And in 100 years' time, we will not care that the plastic industry has disappeared. That's an interesting one, Steve. I mean, I often love in this one that when we're thinking about net zero, that I agree on single use plastics, but actually turning CO2 and waste gases into long life plastics might be a good solution for net zero. But I'm going to leave that one at there because I don't want to start a very long debate on plastics at this one. Uh, right, let's have a look at some other questions that have come in. So we have one here, public awareness of circularity does still remain low, and many of the challenges we see would be helped by customer fuel pulp fueled by brands promoting aspirational lifestyles powered by delightful circular products. So after 10 years, kind of, why is the circular economy not moved on from Davos to Cannes in kind of promoting things? I mean, I know we do talk about Love Island now doing kind of eBay reused clothes, but are we seeing any more on that sort of lifestyle as being a really positive thing on products? Um, I'm willing to kind of have an initial go at that. Um, so I think that there, all the data suggests that um, there is a next generation of user consumer citizens who are increasingly interested in sustainability. Um, however, the data also suggests that unless you provide that product and make it as convenient, if not more convenient, and normally in a fairly narrow price point, that they won't actually convert that enthusiasm into uh, actually buying the products, right? So I think the key thing here is to look for opportunities where the circular business model actually enhances the customer experience. It makes it more delightful and more convenient. So I'll give you a specific example. So uh, we are an investor in a business called Bike Club, which is based in the UK. And rather than owning a children's bike, you subscribe to that children's bike. Your child typically grows out of its bike every 18 months or so. So a new bike arrives when the old one is ready to be changed up. The old bike gets taken away, it gets refurbished professionally into as new condition and goes out to another customer. Um, and that service has a lot of economic benefits. So it's actually cheaper than buying a new bike, but also it means you don't have to store an old bike. You don't need to maintain an old bike. And as people live in smaller flats and houses in increasingly dense urban environments, there's a kind of benefit to that. So 
with Bike Club, there is a su significant sustainability benefit from the longer life assets and the reduced mothballing period. But actually, that's not the main argument for customers. The argument for customers is this flexible rental model is just more convenient and it's also really cost effective. Um, so I think those are the, from an investment perspective, those are the areas where we see the most traction. Trying to persuade customers to become more sustainable has always been found to be relatively hard work and requires a lot of sort of advertising campaigns, et cetera, and isn't necessarily always that sticky. Yeah. Great. Julia? Yeah, um, I mean, there's a story about herd mentality in relation to recycling that where, and it's anecdotal, I don't know the academic reference for this, but um, apparently when you're introducing a new recycling program into an area, you have to get something, I think it's something like 28% of the people to put out the recycling. And then it sort of goes from nobody's putting out the recycling, nobody's putting out the recycling, they get to 28% and then suddenly 95% of the people put out the recycling because people do what others do. So I think there certainly is, um, at the moment, I think maybe there it's still at an early adopter stage where there aren't enough people who have that interest in sustainability to carry along the rest of the herd. Um, and so I think that, for instance, advertising companies, I don't know if this is at all feasible, but it seems to me that, that we need to promote the circular economy more to a point that you know, Khan is willing to have it there, basically, and then it will take off. And 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 the other thing that I wanted to say about that, though, is we, you know we think a lot about consumer goods like clothing and and uh, other kinds of products that are short lived. And there's no doubt that there um, it's worth trying to create a circular economy for those. But a lot of the impacts are still from materials like food waste and construction, where the sort of aspirational stuff doesn't really enter into the picture. And yet, it's a really big part of the economy. Great. Okay, moving on to another question. Oh, Steve, do you want a very quick I, one I, on that? I actually think it has gone to Cannes. The problem is it hasn't reached Tesco. So yeah. the, the idea that circular is only for people who can buy thousand dollar items, that's that's what we've got to reach. We've got to reach Tesco. Yeah, I was going to say, I, the fashion particularly, there are some really sort of prominent and very expensive yeah. aspirational sort of circular brands. Yeah, the issue is uh, the other things. Oh, definitely your shirt. I'll punch my belt as well as uh, Elvis and Cressy do wonderful things. Anyway, okay, moving on. Uh, data was mentioned earlier, and we've got this um, point made here about and whether dis or misinformation has grown in parallel to growing literacy. And wondering about when a company that was uh, using an LCA piece of software with questionable credentials, but very good salespeople. And uh, something we kind of flag is sometimes people get um, things like LCA tools or you know the, the, the promise of big data, and actually sometimes get blinded by the numbers. And you know, so the computer says yes, computer says no. How much are we letting these kind of softwares and data actually take out the human from kind of the decision making on whether this is more sustainable? So are these tools actually helping us or have they just got very good salespeople behind them? Julia. Yeah, I do think we have to be very careful about these tools. LCA is a very complicated process. It's a, it's a complicated model with a lot of parameters and it needs an educated some user to, to apply it um, properly. And I think that is one of the challenges we have is to be able to understand impact um, using some kind of a simplified system so that there are a few, we need sort of rules of thumb that it's obvious that people should follow. I, I kind of do subscribe to the Thousand Flowers um, model as well, and, and hopefully everything is going in the right direction, but it is possible to make some really serious mistakes. And, and so I think we need to invest more in coming up with more simplified systems that are easy to apply um, and, and not hide it behind a lot of um, software that only expert users should be using. Any more views on data or tools, Steve or Jamie? Um, there's a really good paper written by Michael Brangart, the author of Cradle to Cradle, um, trying to, or talking about this, called uh, Eco Efficiency versus Eco Effectiveness, where he had an argument with the basically the kind of LCA society about the fact that the majority of LCAs were really good at looking at linear business models and were not um, able to take into account multiple use cycles to the full extent. That was probably in like the early 2000s, but a lot of developments have happened since then. But I guess some of those risks still exist, but it's a good paper to have a look at. Okay, 
Yeah, and in fact, we were spotting a couple of projects kind of in this area trying to bring circularity into tools. And it is such a non-trivial thing trying to allocate sort of what portion of that product goes back around that circle into kind of the numeric. So, yeah, not an easy place. Steve? And if you and if you want to turn people off circular economy, let's have an LCA debate. Right. <laughs> Uh, we, and this is one of the challenges here that, uh, you know, the lovely Dr. Litos is a blinking educator. We just have to keep pushing the literacy up. We're on a journey. Right now, there are a lot of charlatans and people taking advantage. But if we educate people, they will be better able to spot that. Yeah. And then they'll disappear. So yeah, do, I, your, I, do your job, Dr. Litos. I mean, certainly we, uh, we we certainly try and kind of put in uh, some of our proposals. We want to see demonstration of life cycle thinking. You know, even if we'd like to see everybody kind of involved in a proposal, sort of showing that they understand what a life cycle look like. It doesn't matter if they don't know every number in it, but just a sense of this might increase water use, this might increase energy use in order to recover materials is much more important than saying we've got some WYSI software and a tool and somebody who will be doing that in an isolated work package. Okay, uh, moving on to some more questions. Um, Steve, you mentioned about uh, the challenge to recycling specific elements, um, particularly when they get sort of distributed in, in small quantities. Do we see any other sort of general specific challenges in, in achieving a circular economy when we're getting technology innovations that are urgently needed in a lot of kind of renewable energies progressing at pace? So, I, I mean, I'd love somebody to find a way to unlock big companies so that they, what we know, for example, Rolls-Royce with its power by the hour business model and all of that crap, they sell about 50% under the total care contract scheme and about 50% in then their old uh, scheme. And that means they can't optimize their design for circularity in life because their design has to be sold under both schemes. This is them caught halfway across the chasm. You know, you can't cross chasm in two leaps argument. I think that I'd love somebody to help me understand how big companies can do that. What I'm seeing, and we're working with some of these big companies, they are actually investing their own money in brands that they are not associated with so that they can run the experiments. They will then, if it, ex it if it succeeds, pretend to buy up that startup. So they're trying to find ways to experiment that are safe and keep their brand safe. Quite fun. An interesting space. Jamie, have you got anything on, on new technologies or Julia on things that people are putting into buildings that are messing up your recycling? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's an interesting question because we have so much technology and a lot of it is about applying what we know more wisely, um, which is not to say that there's no room for technological innovation. I mean, the most amazing innovations are the ones that if, you know, I haven't, I can't articulate what they are because they haven't been invented yet. So there can be these things that um, come out of the woodwork. I mean, I think in stru construction, we need light weighting and demountable structures. And, and Jamie said something about disassemblable um, products and a, a building as a product in the same way. We need to, it's, um, it's surprisingly a challenge. You, th you know, you think whether you bolt it or you weld it, um, isn't that big a change, but in fact, there are lots of connections in parts of buildings that are more complicated than that, and you know also need to be earthquake proof and whatever. So, um, so I think there's some technology in there, and 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 and, and just generally in, in light weighting. I mean, I, do you know one of the nice things about circular economy is in fact that many people can sort of collect under the umbrella of it um, without worrying too much about the details, but. And so I think everybody's definition of the circular economy is different, but mine very much includes reduction in materials demand. Um, and, um, and I think um, technologies that will help us with that are something that we really need. Yeah. I mean, something you touched on as well is that difficulty in the lifespan of a building and getting materials back. And, you know, we often see new entrants to the construction market saying, I've got to, I've got to really sustainable product it's come from this waste biomass it's come from this waste other thing and it's combining all these things together and look it, therefore it must be sustainable and uh, but then no knowing is that business still going to be there in 10 20 years how is it going to get that material back to make that material more sustainable is a real challenge 
And obviously some of the questions is, should we just make everything out of a handful of very simple materials that may be suboptimal in their you know, initial thing, but actually more optimal when you look at the, the big, big picture. Okay, I shall move on in terms of that one. Uh, Jane, you had a specific one here about, um, in terms of the drivers of circular economy, you mentioned financial benefit being there, such as higher margin of return. Could you talk a bit more about how circular businesses can generate financial benefits? And from an investor perspective, do you trade off investment returns for environmental objectives in order to invest in circular businesses? Yeah, so I think two questions there. So the, the first one, so how do circular business models drive returns? Well, there's a number of... Um, kind of levers but one of them is as discussed if i um go back to that example of it products and i rent them to you and i refurbish them each time and hopefully i even start to tweak the design of the products to be able to last longer as well then i've got to give an asset and i'm able to extract more value during the useful life of that asset so i'm reducing the time it sits in a drawer and i'm making the product last longer by preventatively maintaining it or refurbishing it between each cycle. And that allows me to extract more financial value for any given unit, right? So that would be one way. Um, the second thing obviously is I can cascade that asset into a secondary use cycle potentially. So I may have a product. So for example, we have an investment in a Danish business called Shark Solutions, which links to another question someone had posted in every car windscreen, there is a layer of a very high performance polymer called polyvinyl butyrol that stops your car windscreen from shattering in an accident. Um, and this company is able to extract that polyvinyl butyrol, very difficult to get it out of the windscreen because it's stuck to the two layers. And then that polyvinyl butyrol can be used in a range of industry applications to displace materials like PVC and bitumen, which are very problematic from a sustainability perspective because the PVB is non-toxic um, and is very re recyclable in itself. Um, so that would be cascading. Um, the other thing that the circular economy does is it, it creates these stickier customer relationships. So there's a reason for me to come back. Um, so for example, in a model whereby I'm returning the product or I'm renting the product, I get to interact with you as a user or a customer again. So there's an opportunity then to keep in touch with you. It's not a single sales model where you disappear and I then need to acquire you again as a customer. Um, so that, that would be the answer to that part of the question. In terms of the trade-off, so um, we don't see there being a trade-off here. Um, we're looking for businesses where the fact that they have a circular business model is driving premium financial returns. So it's actually out-competing their linear competitors. And we see this very high degree of collinearity between how these companies are actually creating a financially attractive business model and how they're generating the impact. So we're looking to invest in businesses where the more they grow, the more positive impact they will have and the more of the linear economy they will displace. Excellent. Now, I just want to come back to kind of the discussion areas that um, were posed by the uh, sort of CE Hub team. Just one question we were asked about kind of the key learnings in circular economy over the last 10 years. One thing I want to pick is, have we picked up enough the key learnings of where things don't work? In circularity where people just keep trying things over and over again and spending public money or otherwise or their own private money kind of doing the same thing again are we capturing those we're very good at these case studies of here's a successful business but do, do any of our panelists have examples of uh, things that don't work or haven't worked in the past in circularity i mean i think one thing i'd say is that we don't really um we can still get caught out by unintended consequences. And I, I don't, so I, I remember the, uh, in the early El MacArthur Foundation meetings, we heard a lot from Airbnb and Uber um, who have all, who have both had, which fundamentally are promoting a sharing economy and are part of the circular economy. And yet all these other things have happened that have resulted in public relations issues for them. Um, and that couldn't have been foreseen, really, or maybe they could have been foreseen if you know enough scenarios had been analyzed or something. And so I, I think one thing is when you're really trying to do something paradigm shifting, um, a lesson for me is you really have to think about what the consequences um, can be um, and be brave, but also be careful. Yeah, excellent. Now, I appreciate we're kind of the last five minutes. Steve, do you want to say anything on that? 
Well, if you want to go to the last five minutes, it's really a minor point, but I do get a lot of people walking up to me and saying, I've got this cool technology that can recycle X. And I think, well, that's probably the fifth person in the last decade to do that. And it, uh, to have a technology centric view and not understand how materials flow and who owns them and who's willing to give them up and what the prices might be, a technology centric view on its own, you tend to learn the lessons of the people who went before you. And if only they could share that, they might make an adjustment or they might just decide not to go any further. Definitely. I mean, we get a lot of people saying, I've got this free waste material that no one else is dealing with. And you kind of go, well, what's the incentive to the person with that material? Maybe you can add value to it and not assume that it's going to be free forever in order to justify your business. OK, right. Um, the last one I just wanted to flag since we are going 10 years back, but also 10 years forward. Um, if we could go around the panel sort of thinking, right, we, we're here now. We've got a lot more awareness. We've got a lot more case studies, certainly a lot more reports. What do we need to do in the next 10 years to kind of certainly improve the adoption of circular economy and actually get past the reports and get it much more mainstream? Who would like to go first? Can I do it the easy yeah. bit? Because yes. I actually think my bit is the easiest. As a researcher, um, I would love to be able to study people who've succeeded in a big way. And how did they solve the coordination problem and the scaling problem? Um, you know, it's not my job to invent those, but to observe them would be wonderful. Jamie? Um, yeah, so I think there's a there's a range of things which various different organisations, including the NICE programme, are focused on and others that we've mentioned, like the Alan MacArthur Foundation, in terms of awareness, education, also building kind of policymaker toolkits for things that can be done to accelerate this transition. Um, and then they're also obviously providing proof points in terms of actual products that work and how they create financial returns, etc. I think we're entering maybe a slightly different period of time. So we're seeing more, as, as I alluded to at the beginning, more kind of geopolitical unrest. So we might have a slightly harder time in terms of some of these softer sustainability interests going forwards where people are um, kind of more interested in the day-to-day -day, how they're surviving to get through a difficult period of time at the same time i think the long-term direction of travel around legislation and sustainability is only going to strengthen and also we're in a period where resource price volatility is really high and actually external resources are expensive to buy and that makes the circular economy really attractive and from a geopolitical perspective also we're talking about the potential risks of these longer global supply chains in terms of security, but also resilience. And so I think there's gonna be an increased focus on the circular economy going forwards. That, that would be my view. Yeah, great. And Julia, next 10 years yeah. for you. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm gonna come back to the first point on my last slide, which is was about data systems and um, understanding of flows and impacts. I mean, I think to integrate when you, when you start to do material flow analysis of really the, even the most simple system, it's amazing the insights that you win. And when you start to join it up across different systems, I think we'll be astonished at what we learned from that and how much it enables us to improve our efficiency. And, and by understanding material flows, that lets you move on to understanding the impacts and being able to avoid you know, awful trade-offs that can occur and, and that kind of thing. And I, and I think the second thing is, is also about demand reduction. I think at the moment, um, there is not a sufficient awareness of how much demand reduction needs to be part of the circular economy for us to become sustainable. Definitely, definitely. That would be yeah. my thing is kind of, there's been a lot focused in the past on we've got this waste, what can we do with it? And I think going forward, it needs to be, let's stop that waste even occurring. Let's mm -hmm. cut down on the demand side. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, all panellists. Um, Emily, could I ask you to sort of reshare the slides? Is that possible? The final close. Not sure if that's possible. If it's not possible, Emily has very kind. Oh, here we go. Um, she's very kindly put sort of links to kind of the following webinars in the chat. So we've got one in October on planning and adopting the circular economy, and the November one on circular economy and citizens. And if we go on to the next one, oops, we've gone too far. So um, as she's also put a link in the chat. If you could just spend five minutes letting her know your thoughts on today's events, we do take that feedback on board, on board for dealing with um, future webinars. I'd also say do have a look at the CE Hub website. 
not least because we have a new um, funding program opened for SMEs, UK based SMEs to engage with the NISA program and there are details there on the hub now. So um, please do have a look at that and get engaged with the program going forward. So that just leaves me, if you haven't got the link in the chat, you can also scan the, scan the screen to get to, through to the feedback. But again, thank you very much to everybody. It's been a great discussion and I'm sure we could have 10 years more of discussion if we only got into some of these subjects in more detail. So look forward to seeing many of you again. Thank you very much. <laughs>